go through this. So, you know, just, just so that everyone knows my credentials, uh, I am a medical doctor. On your upper far uh, so, right, there's a section that says play. If you click that, it'll do the slideshow. Oh, okay. Um, right, right. Uh, where is it at? Right so it says format, and then right next to the right to that, it says slideshow, and there's a little red arrow that you can push. I can't really. So where your slide is, then there's a little measure, the four, three, two, one, the three, four. Oh, right I see. Right above that. Right there? It says play, Got and there's it. a red Got button. It. There you go. Got it. Okay. Great. Thanks, guys. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an MD. Uh, uh, you know, I have my medical degree from uh, 2007 from uh, Chicago Medical School. I'm also a BND as of uh, last year, uh, August of 2019. Does anyone know what a BND is? Anybody? Well, it actually means brand new dad, BND. So, you know, I, I, I guess the, uh, the, the point of this talk is that you know, uh, regardless of what your kind of uh, credentials are at the end, um, you know, you know, it just makes common sense. You know, like you know, I you know, I, I recently got in this unfortunate kind of thing with somebody about chiropractors and offering more advice and saying that chiropractors have more training than MDs, and I I, I really just couldn't believe I'm I'm getting into that with on Facebook. So I just uh, you know you know I, I have to kind of watch what I do and. I know that you know the previous uh, speakers were talking about social media and about um, online resources, and I just have to watch out. And there's so much stuff online, and uh, you know, just I, I would just say common sense. You know, and that's what I love about Rotary is uh, there's a lot of common sense people, regardless of our, par our politics, regardless of our personal background, our beliefs. I think Rotarians in general just have a lot of good common sense. And uh, and so this is kind of the the, the uh, the one little funny slide I wanted to throw to you guys, kind of in, in in relation to those degrees, but um, uh, yeah, it, it it is what it is. I just think it's, I thought this was kind of funny, um, but uh, we'll we'll kind of move forward. So just some disclosures, you know, I, I'm I'm a, I'm employed by Hawaii Pacific Health. I'm an emergency physician. Uh, you know, I do do some extra shifts in Kona Hospital. I'll tell you some funny stories about traveling during this uh, COVID crisis later. But uh, I'm also employed uh, uh, by the University of Hawaii, uh, Emma Noah. I'm an assistant professor in, uh, the, at Jabson at the medical school, as well as in the, um, the School of Nursing and Dental Hygiene. Uh, I teach nurse practitioners as well. Uh, I have no financial interests. I'm not getting paid uh, by any corporations. I wish I had some money and uh, some stocks in some of these uh, direct companies, but I don't. Um, I'm also not a primary care physician, so I don't have a private clinic. So, you know, people sometimes ask, hey, can I be one of your patients? Can we, you know, can I establish a relationship? Uh, unfortunately, I only work through the emergency department. Um, and again, this presentation is not an alternative to speaking with your own primary care physician. Uh, I'm also not paid extra, despite what uh, the news might think, uh, to diagnose or underdiagnose COVID-19. So uh, just FYI. So just the basics, this is just a basic slide, uh, straight up just from a Google search. I was trying to find the most kind of comprehensive, again, very common sense, you know, and, and this is kind of, this is definitely not from a medical journal or a medical slide. This is just, just means, hey, do, do things in moderation, you know, uh, make sure you're eating healthy. These are all things that are going to help you kind of um, more or less fight off any type of infection. Specifically, washing your hands, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, your body's kind of in tune. Will these things prevent you from getting an infection? No, except for probably washing your hands and staying away from sick people. Uh, people think, oh, uh, you have kidney disease, therefore you're going to get the disease faster than somebody else. No, you're not going to get the disease faster if you have heart disease or kidney disease. You're going to actually, unfortunately, react more to get once you have the disease. So the whole point is that Everyone on the, is on the same page in terms of getting the disease, in terms of washing your hands, touching your face, touching other people, touching doorknobs. Those are all things that we could do to kind of prevent. And we'll talk about wearing masks here in a second as well. So again, just talking with your doctor. How many of you guys have actually uh, been able to talk to your doctor or have a healthcare uh, kind of appointment um, during this COVID crisis? Has anyone kind of done that? No, not, not really, but that's okay. No worries. Um, but the, the take home lately has been more or less some of the things that are emerging is uh, telemedicine. And um, what's, uh, what's kind of exciting about telemedicine is that it, it was there before. It's been emerging for the last three to five years. And just like Zoom, 
you know, a lot of physicians are actually are, are, are working towards it. And who knows, after this whole COVID uh, crisis half ends, we may actually do more things like Zoom, or maybe more things like telemedicine. So I think it's, it's definitely that's out there. It's definitely uh, involves technology. It, it involves definitely some of the, the stuff we talked about in our track. And, and I definitely encourage people to kind of consider it. Uh, is it uh, does it replace physical exam? Does it replace getting vital signs done? Uh, does it uh, replace uh, actually seeing and talking to a physician overall? No, it doesn't. But for the, some of the basic things like, hey, I have, you know, I have, I need to refill some medication or, you know, I have, a, sounds kind of gross, but I have certain rash that you might be able to see online, et cetera. Uh, you know, I've even been able to kind of see down people's throats to see if they have sore throat or not uh, on, on, online too, surprisingly. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's something that, that works. Uh, you know, it, it definitely helps uh, kind of overall and also doesn't require you to be uh, at home. So you can actually talk with your primary care doctor while you're traveling. I know a lot of Rotarians travel. And so it's a good platform to consider. Um, and just going, going straight up, you know, hitting, hitting this COVID crisis uh, you know, situation, obviously we want to just make sure, and we, we want to social distance. We want to make sure that we're, we're not, again, touching our face, you know, touching things. We want to make sure we clean, you know, I'm not gonna go over the slide too much, but just, I think everyone knows this. I just want to reiterate this. This trumps everything that we've, we'll, we'll be talking about in, the, in, this, in this whole presentation. Just making sure that you just do measures to, to, to prevent infection. And I think overall, the, the concern people have about this uh, coronavirus is like, oh, it's just like X, Y, and Z. It's just like uh, this and that. No, the concern is, is that it spreads actually a lot faster than influenza. It spreads a lot faster than some of these other diseases. People, people keep saying, oh, it's just like X, Y, and Z. It's not. It's not like that. It actually has been tracked to, to actually spread a lot faster. It actually, supposedly because of the coronavirus, it actually stays out longer. It actually can potentially uh, live outside uh, on inanimate services longer. It could actually, you'll see in my later slide, it could actually spread uh, you know, through airborne kind of uh, tracks with high velocity, meaning perpetual coughing, uh, like pr high, high uh, kind of risk procedures like intubation and, uh, uh, you know, like, like, you know, pressure masks that we put on patients. Uh, those are all things that, uh, that can actually, um, you know, make this uh, uh, disease spread faster. And that's, that's the concern that we have. And that's probably why a lot of healthcare workers are getting, it, are getting the infection, uh, surprisingly. Um, and speaking of, you know, this is the kind of the, 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 the picture that everyone kind of fears when someone coughs in the elevator or coughs kind of in the store or whatnot. And kind of looking at this more in depth, you know, looking at the, if you look at the top of the slide, it says 70 kind of centimeters across, right? And that's uh, roughly about two feet or so, maybe two and a half, maybe a little more than two feet. Um, and just kind of, and that's, and it's, if you could look at the top of it, it still kind of projects forward. And uh, you can kind of see the projection of that. And so this kind of kind of lets us know, like, hey, the closer you are to somebody, obviously, the, the more risk of getting an infection. And, you know, looking at the different sizes of droplets, you know, obviously, we worry about uh, different types of viruses, different sizes. Obviously, you know, the, the big, scary, deadly ones like uh, the Ebola virus, uh, you know, in what, this is in that kind of one meter range, which is kind of explains why we, you know, at that time, we had uh, these giant, like, space suits and these giant, like, uh, things you see in the media, right, uh, that people are using now. And uh, again, a lot of people, um, you know, are um, healthcare workers who are within that one meter range, maybe should have the, that kind of setup. But, you know, walking down the street, uh, you know, going shopping, probably not necessary to have that, definitely not necessary to have that kind of level of PPE on. And, uh, and this is kind of just the size, you know, the, the, the 0 0.003 to 0.05 micron size is that tiny little virus particle size. Um, and, you know, they still need to kind of latch on to um, a droplet. So whether they're uh, rain droplets or uh, most likely when we sneeze or cough, those are droplets that we actually um, uh, pro project out. And those usually, going back to that um, thing here, you know, those will usually drop in that first meter or so. So, you know, honestly, like, you know, you're, you're going to have the most protection by just staying at least a meter away. Uh, the two meter range will definitely get you outside of that. And, uh, you know, according to the slide here, you know, we'll get you to that 50 kind of micron level. Obviously, the, the virus particle itself is even smaller than that. Uh, so that's the concern, um, you know, when, when we talk about um, airborne precautions. So when, when you kind of like uh, shoot something at a high velocity, uh, and we're talking about like repetitively, 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 those great droplets can actually um, um, break apart. 
And then when those raindrops break apart, it's kind of like they kind of like turn to like a, uh, a uh, like almost like a vaporization or aerosolization, I guess. Uh, I guess it would be kind of like having a, uh, like, I guess it would be kind of like having like a bottle of Windex, right? And as you spray it more and more and more, those particles tend to like um, get smaller and smaller and smaller as they kind of get further away. So that's kind of the idea behind it is just to kind of minimize that. So uh, to prevent that, you just kind of wear a mask to prevent when you cough, you just don't aerosolize on everybody. So it, it's a, it's two way street. You know, obviously we use these, uh, uh, surgical masks primarily uh, to prevent us from spreading our germs onto like a surgical field. And uh, obviously it's a two-way street. Uh, there is some kind of, some of the masks have a, also like a waterproofing kind of on the outside. So if something does splash into our face, it, it'll prevent us from kind of going into, our, in, into us as well. So it's, so it's kind of a two-way barrier. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, I know that a lot of people have questions about what kind of masks we should be using. Uh, you know, th there's four, four different kind of masks here. You know, obviously you have your N95, which is this particulate respirator. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, these really require a fit. Because if you think about it, uh, you know, if there's a gap on the sides, like a lot of these surgical masks have, the whole point of that gap is that is, is to actually allow you to breathe through and, and, and to be comfortable. So you actually are sacrificing comfort for protection with, by wearing this N95. You really, need to, you really need to be sealed to the point where it really is hard to breathe. And, uh, and the reason why we don't recommend this specifically to Kapuna or other people is that, especially people who have a hard time breathing already, is that it can make things worse. Yeah, it could actually reduce the amount of oxygen you're, that you're breathing in, and it actually, it actually can uh, compound your, your pre-existing respiratory condition. So with that said, uh, things like surgical masks, things like uh, uh, cloth masks uh, could work, especially if you're outside of that, uh, that close range of somebody who is actually having a uh, high velocity kind of, uh, um, you know, spray or aerosolization on you. Um, uh, the one here on the bottom left here, that green colored uh, 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 mask is, uh, you know, I think in some parts of Asia they call it a, a pataya mask, I think. Uh, uh, it's actually a double layer. It's actually kind of uh, um, um, a mask that they wear a lot in, uh, in Southeast Asia when they're kind of on, uh, on um, mopeds and motorcycles and whatnot. And uh, that, that, that could work too primarily because it has multiple layers inside uh, versus something like a cloth mask. Sometimes it only has one or two layers built in. So obviously the answer to this also is the more layers, the better, you know, in, in some of these cloth masks. And, and uh, some of the studies here that, you know, we, we see here, this is just uh, on, on a single kind of layer. So keep that in mind that this is kind of the, uh, the idea. And I think someone mentioned uh, like, you know, HEPA filter, vacuum uh, kind of uh, filters, and th they work great as well. And again, this is also assuming that it covers the entire mask. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, it covers the entire uh, face and has, has, a, has at least decent kind of covering of that area. By no means are these respirators. And that's kind of what I talk about with the N95. The N95 is a respirator where you're breathing in constantly uh, that those airborne particulates. This is just to protect you if something is sprayed or coughed on you or, sp or splashed on you more or less. And, uh, and again, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't have a, um, an answer as to which one works best primarily because it's all about availability. It's all about common sense. So will, will, uh, will uh, multiple layers of a hundred percent cotton t-shirt uh, be just as good as a dishcloth? I don't know. I'm not going to answer that, but it, it makes sense. You know, it, it, the common sense of it will be, yeah, I don't have the scientific data to, to prove that, but that, so I guess in the end, just use common sense. Uh, I think that's the, the kind of the primary kind of recommendation on my end with some of these um, masks. And uh, you know, this is a kind of a, a shameless plug for our own district. Uh, we are making these cloth masks. I know that uh, Laura Silquist, uh, as, as well as Naomi, has sent multiple emails about this. Uh, this is a good way to support the district. This is a good way to utilize the fabric that we have already for our law shirts. And uh, you know, obviously, you know, I've seen these masks, and I'm going to be honest with you. As a cloth mask, I would give my doctor stamp of approval on these masks. So uh, just uh, not that that means much, but uh, uh, kind of keep that in mind that. I do think, think that as far as cloth masks go, uh, uh, the, the shape and the, um, and the kind of the, the design of these are, are key. Um, the, um, the one thing to consider also is uh, just kind of making sure that they kind of fit loosely, just because just because something looks cool, it may not fit you completely, you know, and, uh, you know, obviously the smaller the face, the smaller the head or the bigger the head, uh, the, the, the mask may not fit all the way. So uh, the second part of my talk, I'm going to actually talk primarily about, uh, you know, disease prevention and treatment. And, uh, you know, obviously it is one of the six areas of foc uh, focus for Rotary. Um, 
you know, it's, you know, the, the, the disease prevention and treatment part also goes hand in hand with a lot of these other um, uh, areas of focus, you know, specifically, in, you know, in, you know, my, you know, my biggest success in Rotary has been with uh, water sanitation and hygiene, but obviously it does, it does kind of uh, go into maternal child health, obviously peace and uh, building and conflict prevention, as well as uh, basic literacy, because if people just don't know uh, about how to, how to take care of themselves, how are they going to take care of themselves, right? And then uh, uh, lastly, it does obviously have a huge economic impact because if we could keep people healthy, they could actually go to work. They could actually, uh, we got to prevent things like an economic shutdown like we, like we have now. So there's definitely a lot of things that interrelate with disease prevention and treatment. Um, I'm, these next slides are just uh, primarily just from Rotary. And I just wanna just kind of, uh, you know, uh, just let people know that, you know, this is definitely something that's ongoing. This is definitely something that's uh, kind of a, um, a lifetime, lifelong, organization-long commitment that Rotary has. And, it, you know, it definitely, um, you know, stems from back when, you know, the, the four fa forefathers of Rotary, you know, built that, uh, you know, that, those toilets in Chicago, you know, to, you know, to not only, to, you know, not only for WASH, but also to prevent disease and promote health. Um, Ultimately, just the idea behind uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases, uh, kind of, uh, you know, I think there's a huge divide in this. Uh, obviously, communicable diseases are usually uh, due to some type of infection, uh, usually viruses, bacteria, uh, funguses, parasites, uh, things you can catch from one another, versus non-communicable diseases, which are things like cancer, uh, things like uh, hypertension, diabetes. Um, you know, stroke, uh, th those are kinds of things that, uh, that, uh, that, that are harder, in my opinion, to actually prevent. And so if you look at World Health Organization guidance, as well as what Rotary is focusing on, obviously the communicable diseases have the biggest bang for the buck. You know, they are the low-hanging fruit that we could actually save a lot more lives uh, uh, with, with less impact and less money. But uh, obviously Rotary embraces all of those, uh, including uh, providing... Um, um, uh, treatment and a bunch of other things. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, uh, in, in addition to that, obviously, best practices, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, this idea of global health, the idea that everybody is actually entitled to healthcare uh, to some degree, uh, whether it's basic healthcare versus advanced healthcare, that's all for politicians to decide. But uh, I would say that uh, definitely uh, Rotary falls in line with, uh, you, know, you know, the right to basic health uh, for everybody. And I think that's what uh, drives me uh, to continuing my membership into Rotary. Um, and, you know, going through this, uh, not to bore you guys too much with the details, but, uh, you know, we all know that there are definitely different modes of, uh, of um, helping. Uh, not only do we have these Rotary Action Groups, something that I kind of learned uh, more recently was this Rotarians for Family Health and AIDS Prevention. Uh, and that's definitely something that's, uh, that's really, really uh, impactful, specifically with the recent decline in, uh, in HIV AIDS. Um, and in addition to that, just working with uh, local governments uh, for these uh, immunization days, um, and specifically, uh, you know, right now working, uh, you know, just the sheer number of Rotarians trying to help and work in uh, countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, which, uh, which have these uh, kind of these lingering cases, unfortunately spreading cases of polio still going on. And uh, something that uh, we could do more locally, obviously, is these uh, Rotary Community Corps, uh, which, you know, you know, that might be something uh, we may want to consider developing in our district, uh, something that's more health focused and getting some of our healthcare workers uh, that, are, um, that are in Rotary more kind of aligned together and maybe create this kind of this uh, community core of uh, health workers that are non-Rotarians to kind of work with those of us that are Rotarians to kind of help our community in some of these projects uh, locally here. And uh, ultimately, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about the global grant kind of details too much, but just understand that there are a lot of uh, global grants that focus on disease prevention and health. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, there's definitely multiple ways of, 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 of providing those, whether it's scholarships for, uh, you know, for health professionals to come to the states or to continue learning in their own countries uh, to actually uh, uh, help our current uh, frontline health workers, um, you know, dealing specifically with this COVID-19 crisis, which uh, I think our, our district is working on right now, uh, to other kind of things like uh, the Home Project, which is a mobile kind of uh, health clinic that, uh, that our, our Rotary Club is kind of promoting. And 
uh, you know, not to do too much of a plug for my own Rotary Club, but, uh, you know, we just had last week, we had a good talk uh, from uh, Rich Zegar, who uh, uh, gave a great presentation on uh, the Romania craniofacial uh, VTT program, the Vocational Technical Training Program, uh, that our club's kind of spearheaded for the last five years. And so just something like that, you know, it's definitely not in the scope of, uh, of communicable disease we talked about, but it's definitely something that promotes health. It definitely adds to a, a, a country's uh, um, all six areas of focus, I would say, in terms of uh, kind of helping them out overall. Um, and kind of lastly, just, you know, just some resources, uh, you know, overall for, you know, for our Rotarians uh, in this talk right now. Uh, you know, if you just literally just go to Rotary.org and just click the little link for, um, for, for disease prevention and health, uh, you'll, you'll see there's kind of these tools. And I, I think uh, specifically there is an actual, I don't have the, the link here specifically for it, but there is actually one specifically for ways to help your community uh, um, you know, deal with uh, some of the things. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to pretty much just kind of close up my presentation here and then see if you guys have any specific questions. I know that uh, uh, it seems like I'm getting some text messages already or some chats already from people. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, tell everyone, you know, some kind of um, invite for people if they want to kind of email me, reach out to me, um, and, and perhaps we can even create a network of other health providers in Rotary uh, to kind of help fill that void that we might have right now. So I'll stop sharing. Um, please let me know if you have me. I see, um, I see some people here that are... Um, yeah, so I, I, have, I have a question here that's... Uh, you know, that, that there says here, um, yes, I, I, I just wanted to also add, you know, I'm, I'm going to agree with uh, this one uh, chat text here, more or less. Um, I'm not sure if the, they want me to kind of, uh, you know, advertise to them, but I'm just going to agree overall that definitely cloth masks are not uh, uh, recommended in the healthcare arena, uh, primarily because of that that, that, that short uh, distance that we are to patients and primarily because of the protection uh, that the cloth masks unfortunately won't provide in that short kind of one meter kind of range. And, uh, and, and also dealing with, and like we talked about earlier, aerosolized kind of particulate, especially when dealing with some of these high risk procedures we talked about. So, um, and then I guess someone else mentioned something about, um, yeah, I, I see the message to everybody. Uh, definitely the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, you know, definitely uh, was concerned. It was a third and fourth wave that killed the majority of people. So definitely agree with that. Uh, you know, there's, there's definitely some maps out there that show that uh, October might be the next wave. Uh, you know, that's coming up with, uh, in, in, you know, with, with the elections and everyone else worrying about that as well. So uh, just, you know, I, I just think that uh, everyone should, should um, you know, should just continue to be mindful, continue to be um, kind of vigilant about uh, their health practices. I do, I don't think we'll ever go back to normal, um, you know, after something like this, uh, you know, at least our generation. And I guarantee you that generation after the 1918 uh, Spanish flu pandemic probably was a lot more vigilant than, than we were in the 70s and 80s later, you know, after that generation kind of passed. So kind of, uh, and it's kind of unfortunate, but we seem to not kind of uh, always learn from our, our mistakes or our kind of our, not necessarily mistakes, I guess, just our experiences, I should say. But, uh, but you know, and uh, someone just asked me for my uh, email address. So just, I wrote it there in the chat, but it is uh, james.ham at gmail.com. Pretty easy to remember. I was uh, part of that beta Gmail group that uh, sent out. So I luckily got my full name, luckily. Uh, but, um, and uh, yeah, and I'll definitely share this uh, uh PowerPoint presentation with Naomi to, to put, put up and we'll also uh, if anyone else is interested I could uh, I'll, I'll definitely put it up on either on a email if I can't email because it's too big I'll try to uh, send it via like a Dropbox link or something like that as well um, but uh, yeah and, and uh, you know I, I definitely uh, I see here that somebody somebody is interested in uh, the um, recommended the, this book American Pandemic and I, I agree you know there's definitely um, a lot of good books out there um, and you know I, I haven't read that one specifically but I definitely agree that uh, you know definitely getting some reading in while you're kind of um, probably reading a book on the on the subject is probably better than getting on to a lot of this uh, social media uh, um, you know CNN versus Fox News kind of garbage that's going on unfortunately back and forth you know so I just again I'm not picking a side I'm just saying both sides have uh, have issues and let's just kind of if you can just take a step back and maybe just read a book about it it might be better um, 
any any other um, questions or comments? I know um, kind of finishing a little early here, but um, if, it, if it was my students, I guess in this, uh, they'd be really happy to go to lunch early. Good presentation, thanks, Jim. Thank you, thank you, Dick. Hey, uh, James, can you talk about uh, Hawaii towards zero and what you're doing? Yeah, with yeah, the so, app? yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. So, um, Hawaii towards zero is actually uh, an organization uh, by um, uh, founded by uh, Leo. Kolo Matanga, I think I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, he's an NFL lineman uh, from Hawaii, uh, Samoan obviously by his, by his name, but uh, he went to University of Hawaii uh, and he's now a lineman with the uh, New York Jets. And he's kind of, he really just said, just sitting at home, sheltering in place, he really wanted to do something. And, you know, he's, you know, he's 25 years old, but he speaks like he's uh, one of our senior Rotarians. It's just an amazing uh, gifted man. Uh, but he's, he's put together this organization just to help. And it's, whether it's helping with uh, uh, tracking the virus and he's helped, he's actually, uh, instead of relying on our government, uh, which, uh, you know, people may have some issues with uh, uh, relying on some of that information, he's, he, they created a, a way to actually, uh, people could just uh, let them know, hey, uh, I have, uh, you know, I tested positive, uh, what resources do I have? How can I get help? And vice versa, being able to, you know, offer that information up and saying, hey, someone from the West side uh, has the disease X, Y, and Z. So we could actually track which, zip codes or which areas within our own island here uh, uh, actually um, have it and which resources actually are needed. And one of the resources that they come up with, which is really cool, is uh, a, um, a hotline to call. And uh, he's kind of gotten a few of us healthcare providers, uh, not, doctors and nurses to actually, uh, um, you know, get on this app. And uh, he's very tech savvy as well. He's, he's actually got a, several people that are um, working for him that are uh, super tech savvy. And they've created this app where people could just um, phone in and then the app will actually call me and let me know and let me know if I need, if I could take this call or not. And then I'll just answer basic kind of health questions using uh, CDC guidelines. I'm not trying, I'm not prov providing any medical advice per se, but just, uh, just kind of reiterating the, the guidelines. If they do sound really sick, obviously we're going to recommend they go to the, to, to go get help and get, and get care. Uh, but uh, outside of that, something like that's been helpful. Another, another kind of uh, multi-pronged approach to kind of helping with the, uh, uh, this disease and get literally Hawaii towards zero on, on the on the COVID is uh, working in the community and I think uh, helping out specifically with uh, Kapuna Hour when we have shopping, uh, you know I think it was noticed um, you know obviously now that uh, a lot of the stores are required to actually have masks on but still a lot of people don't have masks and I think uh, one project that they're working on is providing some of those masks uh, for those um, um, you know, and also other shoppers coming into the store to actually offer them a mask. And not necessarily uh, ostracizing them or make them feel bad for not having a mask, but just saying, hey, uh, we care about you. Here's a mask. We just want you to consider wearing it and then kind of go from there. Uh, and uh, I think that's, a, that's probably a better Hawaii approach than, uh, you know, point the finger at them, getting the cops involved and, you know, kind of, kind of uh, uh, causing more beef than actually uh, 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 need be. Uh, with that said, uh, at, the, at these stores, uh, they actually are also um, implementing uh, hand wash stations, which is uh, super exciting. Um, and again, it may, it may not be the 100% solution. I know some people have a lot of technical kind of uh, concerns about this, you know, where are they going to get the water from? Where is it going to drain off to? Who's going to maintain this? Where are they going to get the soap to wash the hands? X, Y, and Z. But uh, Wayne, shoot, I forgot his last name, but he is the owner of all of the uh, Ace Hardware stores outside of Oahu. Um, and he's also partnered with the Ace Hardware stores on Oahu as well to actually uh, um, start, um, they've already started designed and built these, uh, uh, these sinks. And they've actually uh, worked with uh, not only the Ace Hardware stores, but also with uh, Home Depots, Costco's, um, Foodland, Safeways, uh, and uh, Times, KTA, all, all these grocery stores. Uh, they've kind of, uh, and he's using his kind of NFL probably, uh, you know, status to kind of talk with some of these uh, people and, uh, and uh, more or less, ask these stores, hey, would you be willing to put up a sink in your, uh, or a few sinks in your, in front of your store? Would you be willing to provide the, uh, the, the maintenance and the, and the staff to actually um, do this? Um, and at the same time, would you also be willing to uh, help with uh, 
uh, you know, maybe passing out some of these masks too. And it's, it's, it's in the end, it's a no brainer for the store if it's uh, gonna help uh, produce, uh, you know, reduce infection, you know, less people with dirty hands are gonna touch the produce, you know, uh, et cetera, right? So it's, it's kind of, it kind of makes sense. It may not be the right answer, you know, but it is, it is one solution to help, uh, you know, especially with the hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer being such a limited uh, resource right now. And uh, what's also kind of exciting, just kind of a side note, uh, you know, Wayne is also working on this like ozone water uh, hand wash technology, which is super cool. Uh, he's willing to foot the bill. He's already put in 10 grand into this project to help. Uh, and he's, he's kind of, he wants actually to install some of these ozone filters. Um, so I'm not ozone filters, I'm sorry, ozone uh, water stations, which I guess this ozonated water can actually sterilize and kill bacteria and viruses as well. And I guess they, they, they use it a lot in uh, public um, bathrooms and stuff like that in Taiwan. So you don't need soap. You just put your hands in this ozonated water and it kind of sterilizes uh, your hands. And then the, oz the ozonated water uh, dissipates within like a few minutes after, uh, after, after um, being exposed to the air. So just kind of an interesting technology. It's kind of cool to see these people kind of come out and uh, each sink is only a hundred bucks. You know? So, you know, uh, right now in my club, uh, we, we've put together, uh, you know, 1200 bucks to, to get, uh, uh, you know, 10 to 12 of these sinks uh, put up. And, you know, we're looking at partnering with uh, a food land and Foodland has a huge rotary kind of connection with uh, Solly Sullivan and the Hawaii Rotary Youth Foundation. Um, and uh, just, you know, just kind of, you know, I, I think it's a great way for, for us to give back. And, you know, I was, you know, I'm kind of rambling now, but I uh, just want to see if anyone has any other questions about uh, Hawaii to Zero and some of the efforts that uh, we're doing, at least here on Oahu. James, is that the name of a website? Hawaii uh, towards Yeah, zero? you know what, it's, um, you know what, if you just literally Google Hawaii towards Zero, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you the website. I'll put it in the, um, um, in the, in the chat box right now. Thank you. Yeah, yep. appreciate it. Yeah. Any other questions? James. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Hi, James. Um, you mentioned, uh, thanks for the great presentation. And you mentioned briefly about um, healthcare workers uh, who must be at uh, highest risk or their families at this time. In places like India, uh, for example, government is providing free five-star hotel rooms to healthcare providers, so they can they don't have to go straight to their home. Instead, they can go to a hotel and sleep, or uh, get shower and then go home. And I'm assuming we don't have something like this. I wonder what uh, what your thought would be like. Do you think that's really um, uh, like needed? or if something we can do something like that, or you just, I just want to know your thought about this. Yeah, so uh, one of the sites that I actually uh, volunteer at with the home project, which is that homeless outreach medical education van, uh, is actually uh, over at St. Mary's Church on King Street in the Moiliili area. And uh, on the Thursday mornings uh, where we go, when we go, um, uh, there's actually a, um, like a shower kind of, uh, um, I guess trailer that comes by and I've seen this trailer also in Kaka'ako and I'm not sure if they actually uh, partner specifically with home I have to ask Jill and Mori about it but uh, it's interesting because it's literally a one-stop shop you, you go there you take a shower uh, there's also the church hands out clothes uh, you get a, you get a fresh set of clothes you get uh, you get some health care while you're at it uh, and then you get a chatted up with some uh, students uh, I swear I, I feel like the students are just there to provide uh, entertainment and uh, and chat support with some of these guys but it's still a cool opportunity but uh, but in the end you know I, I think things like that are, are definitely important uh, for places like uh, that have a high um, volume of homeless and people in need um, again I'm not I'm not too certain as to what the city is doing per se but I know that there's definitely some organizations out there I think there's at least two or three of these organizations that are providing showers out there uh, I, I definitely agree that hygiene, uh, uh, you know, regardless of its, um, you know, washing hands or just full body showers, I think, you know, just promoting hygiene in general is definitely important. And I think, you know, um, you and I, Arjun, you know, we're both on these uh, projects in other countries and, uh, you know, internationally, and, you know, this is kind of an interesting kind of concept for us to bring wash projects to the United States, which, um, you know, five months ago, three months ago, we never would have thought we would be doing a wash type project in, on Oahu, right? And, uh, you know, and definitely I would like to see this project expand out and, you know, perhaps we could even use some of these uh, hand wash stations and some of these, uh, you know, uh, you know, high volume areas instead of having, uh, you know, people come to, um, 
uh, like, you know, city parks where there are a lot of kids or a lot of tourists kind of involved and, you know, people in need will go to those areas, unfortunately, uh, interact and have some, maybe even some bad interactions with some of those people. We just had, you know, a, a near death here at, uh, at Mother Waldron Park in Kaka'ako with a Japanese tourist and a homeless guy. Uh, as well. So, you know, just kind of trying to avoid some of these inter negative interactions. I think maybe, uh, you know, doing the opposite and reaching out and maybe providing some of these more mobile kind of setups might be more important. And, you know, again, this may be the silver lining too. And honestly, from a homeless perspective on Oahu anyway, uh, you know, we definitely have a lot of, um, we have a lot of, uh, a lot more resources with uh, uh, Scott Miskovich and, uh, uh, and Lieutenant Governor Josh Green uh, helping out with uh, the homeless. And they set up a, a COVID uh, Kind of shelter for uh, for patients that are uh, either waiting for their test results to come back or people that are positive, and uh, I know that uh, um, um, and Kathleen Merriam actually uh, you know led a great project to help those people out as well. And I think you know just seeing some of these 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 partnerships help, and I think uh, this may be the silver lining where we may actually start helping more of our own community because of this. And I think uh, you know a lot of people are persevering at their homes, kind of worrying and having you know you know anxiety provoking kind of nightmares and stuff like that. I know a lot of people have talked to me about that. Uh, but maybe we could put that uh, that revved up energy to good use and start uh, getting out there. And um, you know, maybe when this ban gets lifted, obviously, I think uh, you know, obviously, the ban getting lifted doesn't mean that we're going to be going back to our normal our normal selves. We're still going to be taking our precautions. But maybe that might be a good time for us to uh, get out there and, and help some of these uh, areas in need. Dr. Ham, yes, uh, great job. It's it's uh, chemo Jim and Hilo. Hey. Um, I just want to say what a great job you did, and uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to serve with you on the International Service Committee. Uh, as you know, I'm connected with a global telemedicine global grant uh, that we're uh, now right now doing in uh, Nepal. Uh, it's a, evolving into a fantastic, uh, a very, very successful VTT. Um, I wanted to mention to you that we are doing uh, our particular nonprofit does and what we call a grand rounds. It's a global grand rounds. And we have one uh, that we're doing. It's called Asian grand rounds. Um, and we'd love you to be a guest. Uh, I can plug you in. Uh, it'll be at 9 p.m. Uh, Thursday, the 23rd. And what we're uh, dealing with is we're dealing with the COVID-19. And uh, we've got a group of hospitals. Uh, we're in uh, the Philippines, Nepal, China, as well as India. And of course, uh, seeing our uh, VTT team there, um, they'll all be discussing you know, how they're treating the COVID-19. So, uh, and I wanna just mention anyone on this call is interested in participating. I uh, have my email on uh, the chat, so. Uh, but I wanted to just uh, make you aware of that because uh, not only do we need you at Global Telemedicine, but we need you here in Hawaii. And it's so great to have a Rotarian like you, um, you know, practicing medical doctor, uh, dealing with the technology and all the challenges that we have, especially here in Hawaii. So much mahalo. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kimo. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there uh, on that call. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, like I said, I'm, I, I think I really do think that uh, with this COVID-19 thing, uh, your uh, telemedicine project is going to expand exponentially. And I'm definitely looking forward to it. I definitely have some other ideas for you. So we'll definitely talk offline. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Yeah, we're, we're uh, expanding by, we're erupting leaps and bounds, so to speak, in a Hawaiian term. But thank you very much. I'll send you an email on that. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Cabral had a question about um, how come some people get it and some people don't. What is the reason for that? Um, honestly, it's 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 hard to say. It's 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 all probability and statistics. You know, obviously, like I, I would say, the healthcare workers get it more because we see more of them. You know, and I think the less uh, New York, uh, I I have a, I have a strong feeling New Yorkers get it because they're uh, in more crowded populations in the subways. Uh, air is not recirculated more often in those areas, um, you know, and, but it's, it's hard to say because, you know, you have other areas like uh, Boston that are hit pretty hard too, and they have a pretty good metro as well. So uh, DC as well. So it's just, it's, I think it's populated areas. Uh, there's also the, um, you know, you know, huge global health uh, experts like Paul Farmer will say things like, you know, obviously socioeconomic status, 
because uh, people are living in uh, more closer quarters. Uh, you know, we were not able to have these giant houses or ranches that separate us up, uh, uh, you know, socially distance us by by uh, by social economic status, right? So I think I think that's kind of the biggest biggest answer. I would say why people succumb to it more often is primarily because of uh, pre-existing health conditions and uh, and the ability to um, uh, kind of uh, you know, stave off some of these, uh, um, these attacks on your organs, you know, especially like kidneys, heart, brain, lungs, obviously, uh, those are uh, a part of the, uh, you know, those are just the basic areas that uh, dysfunction regardless of what kind of infection we have. And unfortunately, uh, you know, there's definitely studies out there that there's this thing called sepsis, which is a, a body's uh, uh, overreaction to an infection. And that's usually what kills us. And it's, it's the body's overreaction. It's, uh, uh, there's a, a good study from, a, um, again, these are all anecdotal kind of studies, but you know, rather than like things like hydroxychloroquine, uh, which you know, works in, uh, as, a, uh, as a reduction of immune response overall, they've actually done studies more specifically on things like, uh, you know, things like interleukin-6, which is a type, specific type of, uh, of uh, um, I guess, um, a reaction mediator that your body kind of secretes when, when, it, when we're having a reaction. And that actually uh, causes a really, really bad immune cascade. And uh, there's a, a, an emergency physician that, uh, that un unfortunately, I know professionally uh, in, in Seattle, uh, he just walked out the door, actually, uh, after being on a ventilator for four weeks. And uh, what saved him, they think, is uh, starting him on that medication. They, they tried hydroxychloroquine. They tried all these other drugs that are talking about the media. They're not working. He's a 44-year-old, uh, you know, otherwise healthy guy. He has, he's a little bit obese. So that now they're saying that a lot of uh, obesity is a, uh, is, is a risk factor too, but that it doesn't, there's no mechanism. It's just a correlation, right? So a, a lot of it is new. Uh, the data isn't quite all there, but definitely elderly, uh, primarily because of uh, the, the lack of ability to um, kind of respond as quickly, you know, um, kids, they say uh, bounce back faster, whether it's from injury or infection or whatnot. But uh, I'm still surprised, you know, me, you know, having an eight month old, you know, who's not fully immunized, uh, you know, and technically is at risk for, you know, influenza and a bunch of other kind of communicable diseases. It's still kind of a mystery to me as to why the infants aren't as uh, infected. They think, uh, uh, they, they think a lot of it has to do with uh, respiratory clearance. Uh, the babies may not be taking big enough breaths to suck in enough. I don't know. I, I don't know all the details, but, uh, but definitely how we, how we uh, get infected uh, amongst ourselves is specifically through that spread of, uh, of um, you know, we call germs, you know? I feel bad for anybody who's German because I think that term has uh, lingered on after World War I, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, I, I'm not gonna go into the politics of, uh, of uh, you know, calling out countries for uh, infections, but uh, I just thought that was kind of a funny little term. We still call it germs, but uh, the Germans aren't up in arms and, and yelling at us about it, but anyway. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is Nancy Cabral, and I, I do want to give a shout out. I'll, I recognize a lot of the names that were at PETS, and I was there, and um, some other people know I mentioned that my father had the coronavirus. He's 92 years old, and my stepmother, 88. They were on that Diamond cruise ship in Japan, so they were in, in a Japanese hospital for 38 days, recovered, have been back home just over a month now, and I was able to spend time. So both of them recovered. My dad, really close. He had pneumonia twice during that time. So, so that's why it's such a mystery, because she was barely sick. She said she would never miss a game of bridge, and there my dad is, you know, practically dead. And they were everywhere together. Their exposure was identical. So strange, but a miracle. So the good news is for those who I was worried about during pets that my father is, is surviving and putting on weight. He lost a lot of weight. So good, good news. That's great news. I'm so happy. That's a, these are the success stories we need to hear about, you know, yeah. and uh, you know, he's probably one of the, um, you know, oldest people to, to survive it too. So, um, you know, that's, that's just makes me feel great. Thank you yeah. so much for the great story. Yeah. Good, good news. <laughs> Thank you for the information. This is fantastic. Thank you, Nancy. Um, any other questions? Um, I'm kind of just scanning through. I see some people have joined. Um, well, we, we're getting a lot of different islands. I, I, I love this. This is great. So in the chat, um, Kat is saying if she creates a survey for Rotarians, uh, would we be interested? So, Kat, um, yeah, I think so. Do you want to send out a survey? 
Kat, by the way, where are you? Are you in Alaska? Where are you? No, I'm in, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm in Colorado. My family has just returned from Hawaii to Alaska and they've just finished their uh, 14th day in quarantine. And I've been in isolation since March 11th with COVID-19. Um, and I was just thinking that it might be interesting for Rotary to know if any of us were in fact infected or any of our near relatives. Do you think that would be helpful, Jade? Yes, I, I do. I think that would be uh, good information, um, at least from our district. Like, I, I would want to know. I'm, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the district, but I'll let Naomi speak on behalf of that. Um, and uh, you know, I'll, obviously, I'll let her bring it up to the RI people. But uh, what do you think, Naomi? Yeah, I think it would be interesting, but we can also add to the um, the Hawaii Towards Zero because they're doing the survey on where. You know? Yep, I yep, I agree, and and uh, obviously that information. Uh, for them would help and obviously uh, we could create maybe a little subsection within Hawaii uh, towards zero where they could collect that information as well but uh, obviously if you, if you want if you want me to be the, the point of contact for that I'll be happy to cat as well so just uh, like let me know if you want to create the survey uh, and send it out I'll be happy to help organize it and uh, and kind of at least for the time being um, uh, hopefully my, my, my wife doesn't hate me too much <laughs> <laughs> if you wouldn't mind um, sharing with me your email so I can send it to you Put it in the chat line here. Um, okay. And it's just just so you know as well, it's just my first name dot last name, James dot ham at gmail. Perfect. That's easy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and so um we need to wrap up uh, oh we're a little bit over time, but um the uh the what you towards zero has a call center. So if you would like to volunteer for the call center to take the calls, you can take it from home. Um, if you're already uh, medically trained, you can uh, sign up now. If you're not, then there is, uh, Rotary has a, a training session that you can go through to be a telemedical um, person on phone that you can go to. So go to the globalimpact.org and you can take the session and once you get your certificate, you can sign up for the call center. But I believe they're also looking for educators and attorneys to be on that call center. Um, they're partnering with Kupuna Kokua, and Ko Kupuna Ko Kokua is doing an app. Um, it's going to be out next week where people can go to the app and see, I need this, or I can do this, and it's kind of a, an exchange of, of how people can connect. Something like the caremongering thing that we have, but it's on an app, and if people want to buy their um, goods from a store, then they order it through the app, and then someone would, if they already paid for it, and then somebody goes and delivers it. So that's another thing that people can do for that. But I wanted to um, ask James to do some closing, but after that, if um, Kathleen can give us some tips on breathing and how to relax and not be stressed out. So James, <laughs> closing message? Oh, I'm just, you know, just wash your hands. Don't be dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen? Yeah, sure. Aloha, everybody. Uh, well, I guess um, just to end, it would, might be nice for everybody to take a mental health moment and focus on your mental health. Hopefully everybody is taking time to breathe intentionally and to eat well and to still exercise. This is a really difficult time where everybody is um, having a tough time somehow. Um, if you haven't been diagnosed with a mental health condition, <laughs> many people are feeling mental health uh, related symptoms. So I hope that everybody will take time to focus on their mental health um, during this time and just some basic things of keeping to a routine, getting outside. Um, we're restricted in so many ways. And so um, please be sure to do the basic things of taking time to relax and breathe and thinking positive and um, I think Rotarians, we have a really great advantage because we know that helping others helps us. Um, so I think other people that are really struggling, they're focusing on their own pain and despair and um, they don't have a lot of outlets like we do. So we're very blessed with seeing each other like this. Um, so thank you and, and um, keep those mental health moments coming because that also affects our physical health. Yeah, doctor? Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much. 
keep those mental health moments coming. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay healthy. Thanks, James. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Kathleen. Hey, Have a great day. Aloha. 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 Aloha.